um, first of all, I wanted to thank Oksana and um, the other organisers so much for organising this meeting. It's so nice to see people, if not um, to see everyone in person. Um, so what I thought I would talk about today would be to um, talk about this work that we've been doing to try and make a synthetic paired helical filament. What am I going to tr try and do is to persuade you that we have made one, or at least that we are on the road to making one, and to explain why we even need to make one in the first place. Um, oh, slides. Okay, good. So I don't think I need to go through this particularly. We've had a really nice introduction already to Alzheimer's disease um, um, earlier on today. Um, from uh, Professor Tagliavini. And so um, just to introduce the two um, types of plaques we've got, um, so we've got amyloid fibril plaques on the left-hand side, and then we've got tau uh, neurofibrillary tangles on the right-hand side. And the only thing I wanted to point out here is that we've got electron microscopy images showing um, the deposits of um, fibrils um, in the brain tissue of um, humans. And um, what you can see in the lower panel um, on the right hand side, the neurofibrillary tangles, you can actually see um, the paired helical filaments. Perhaps you can see why they're called paired helical filaments there. But the important thing that I want to um, underline is that A, beta and tau both share the structure of amyloid, the cross beta structure. Um, and this comes in quite, uh, it, it's quite important to point out when at meetings on Alzheimer's disease, because there's a, a temptation for people to refer to amyloid beta as amyloid. And as uh, you're all um, certainly aware, amyloid is much more than just a beta. Um, and so what I'm showing here is um, some evidence that we have collected to show the cross beta structure of amyloid fibrils. Um, and um, what you can see here is the um, cross beta structure uh, cross beta fingerprint that you get from x-ray fiber diffraction and I'm going to show you a quick movie um, to demonstrate the cross beta nature of amyloid fibrils and many of you may have seen this movie before because I love it. Uh, so this is the beta strands running perpendicular to the fiber axis and now you can see the hydrogen bonds uh, running parallel to the fiber axis and creating this incredible uh, strong network and now looking down the fiber axis you can see the interdigitation um, or the steric zipper as it's been called by David Eisenberg whereby um, the two sheets of this filament interact together and form this extremely stable arrangement. Um, so um, I'm not going to say too much more about um, that structure. I may come back to a little a little bit further on. Um, but I'm going to focus entirely on tau now. And so again, this has been introduced briefly already, but tau, um, as you will be familiar, is um, quite a complicated protein. Um, it uh, has six different isoforms and actually it has a hundred different forms that can be present um, in vivo. Um, and it's been most well known as a protein that binds to microtubules, um, but it also has some other forms and it can also be um, post-translationally modified, it can be acetylated, it can be phosphorylated, um, it can be hyperphosphorylated, it can be truncated. So uh, what I wanted to point out now is that tau is much more than just a microtubule binding protein and uh, Mahmoud um, Mena, who works with me, um, did his PhD um, thesis and investigated um, the whereabouts of a non-phosphorylated form of tau. And uh, um, he found that it was um, located within the nucleolus of the nucleus um, and therefore fills a very important function associated with heterochromatin. And so I put some um, references down here just in case um, that's something that you're interested in because it's a side uh, sideline to what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, as I've already shown you, we um, are able to do electron microscopy of tissue sections taken from um, donors who have donated their brain to research. Um, and what I'm showing here is a zoom in on the paired helical filaments that are deposited in the tissue of a, of a patient. And um, you can now see the paired helical filament nature of these filaments. And interestingly enough, there has been recently some um, controversy about whether paired helical filaments actually are paired helical filaments in vivo. And of course, you could argue that um, the processing of the tissue that we've done um, may create them. But um, I think we can um, 
take this as evidence that you can see these filaments in um, in vivo. Of course, this person is not alive, but close close enough. And so here, um, what you can see is the uh, what the little black dots are gold particles um, that we've used to ensure that we're actually looking at tau rather than another filament of structure. So as you will be familiar, um, cryoelectron microscopy um, structure was solved um, in the last few years of um, the paired helical filaments um, from patients when um, the PEHF were extracted um, from tissue. Um, and I'm showing an image here and you can see again that the beta strands are running perpendicular to the fibre axis. And if we look to the left hand side, you can see the conformation of the structure down the fibre axis. Um, my cat keeps meowing, so I'm going to have to put her on my lap so she stops. Sorry. Um, so um, when uh, the, the group of um, Godet and Scherer's um, went on to solve many structures of tau filaments from different diseases. And what's really interesting about this is that although all of these structures share a cross beta structure, well, we assume that they certainly do, um, when you actually look at the um, conformation of the structures, you see that there's a, a, a high degree of polymorphism. So here we have ADPHF uh, and straight filaments, and then we have filaments from um, PIC disease, um, so frontal temporal dementia, um, PICS um, form um, from chronic, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, two types here, and then um, cortical basal degeneration. And so you can see, if we look down the fibre axis, that we do see some differences between these different um, structures. And I always wonder if this might be due to um, the, the earliest changes um, that occur within these patients that trigger the self-assembly of these structures and create a particular polymorph. So what I want to lead on to now is that um, each one of these structures actually does share a certain region or fragment of the structure um, and it's covered by these repeat regions of the protein, the tau protein. So um, tau is um, formed of um, imperfect repeats, um, repeat region two, three and four are all found within the structure. Repeat two is one of these regions that actually can be missing in three repeat tau and it's actually missing from the PIX filaments. So generally the way that tau has been um, examined has been um, by using heparin and the reason for this is because uh, if you take full length tau it's incredibly soluble so you can put it into solution and no matter what you do to it it appears that it doesn't self-assemble so it won't form fibrils and I think it was probably 15 or maybe more years ago um, it was shown that if you add heparin to your solution then you can template self-assembly of the tau and it will form what look like paired helical filaments. So that was a great um, um, advance and meant that people could then make paired helical filaments, or so they thought. But unfortunately, um, the advances in cryo-EM have meant that um, groups have shown that the heparin-induced tau filaments are very polymorphic for a start, and they differ very much from those in Alzheimer's and Pick's disease. And actually now we know that they differ from all of the cryo-EM structures that have been taken ex vivo. And there is also not very strong evidence that heparin is incorporated into the filaments. There's certainly no density um, observed in the cryo-EM structures that could be attributed to heparin. And so what we wanted to do was to create a new model structure. And so we were working with a peptide, which we call DJE. It's a core fragment of tau, and it was first um, discovered um, in 1988, it was characterized, and it's a region that covers mainly R3 and R4. And what you'll realize is that this also correlates nicely with the core structure that's obtained from cryo EM structure. And they had raised an antibody which recognizes the C terminus of this protein, uh, which is called AB4. 423, and a student of mine used this antibody and looked at um, paired helical filaments in tissue and found that these stain nicely with this um, antibody, suggesting that um, at least some of the tau that's found in these paired helical filaments is this truncated form uh, with a truncation um, of the C-terminal at 391. And as I've mentioned already, this overlaps nicely with the structure 
with the um, structures that have been solved by CryoEM. So that's 304 to 378 um, that's shown in grey here with the pink um, box showing the, the um, DJE um, sequence. So then we went on to use um, this peptide and we found that it forms filaments similar to uh, paired helical filaments in brain without additives. So I'm going to try and persuade you um, of that um, case now. So here's some more electron microscopy images of sections of Alzheimer's disease brain. And you can see the paired helical filaments here uh, zoomed in. And again, we've used a gold particle. This time we've used an antibody T, uh, T22, which is an oligomeric antibody uh, specific to oligomeric tau. And that means that it only sparsely uh, recognizes the tau. So it only recognizes oligomers that are associated with the filaments rather than completely coating the filaments meaning that we can now see the structure of these filaments. And so a student called um, Bronwyn Foster did lots of experiments and she compared our paired helical filaments that we formed in uh, vitro that you can see here and you saw in my very first slide and you can see those individually here and compared them with these um, paired helical filaments found in tissue. And she looked at the, um, the width and the um, the repeat distance and with uh, Wei Feng's group, um, Wei Feng Zhu's group in um, University of Kent, we also did some atomic force microscopy and you can see here that uh, really nice repeating distance uh, which uh, ends up being a really nice correlation between the repeat distance seen in paired helical filaments from tissue and those that we formed in vitro. So at least for now we can say that these have similarities although of course they're not identical. And so earlier on today, I was talking to um, Wei Feng um, Zhu about um, this, um, this meeting. And um, he said that Lynx really is very interested in combining lots of different um, techniques. And so I just wanted to show you in the last um, few moments of my talk um, what we've been trying to do. So we're trying to de develop methods to look at the supramolecular and the molecular structure of synthetic paired helical filaments. And of course, this may well be applicable to other structural, um, other um, fibrillar structures. So we're coming back to X-ray fibre diffraction here. And here you can see the 4.7 angstrom reflection that comes from the hydrogen bonded uh, beta strands and the 9.5 angstrom reflection that comes from the beta sheet spacing. And so um, we were lucky enough to obtain some Alzheimer's disease uh, PHFs um, from Michel Godet's group. And although the fibre diffraction pattern is not completely amazing, we could uh, collect some data from it and compare the, the diffraction pattern that we get from DJE with um, the diffraction pattern that we get from Alzheimer's disease paired helical filaments. And I don't have time to show you lots and lots of fibre diffraction patterns that differ from this, uh, but for now at least um, we're on the right track. And so what we can do is we can take um, those structures that were solved by cryoelectron microscopy, and I'm just showing you a selection here, and probably it's too tiny for you to see, but here's Pick's disease, here's uh, paired helical filaments from AD. Um, and you might be able to see, I'll try to uh, sort of increase the um, contrast so that you can see, although you might not be able to see exactly where the reflections are, you can see that there's a different character to each one of these diffraction patterns. So it's possible then that we can take the structure of paired helical filaments uh, or, or um, filaments from different diseases and we can distinguish between them by uh, X-ray fibre diffraction. And then we can compare our structures that we create with those um, that have been calculated from the original cryoEM structures. And similarly, some work done by in Weifeng Zhu's group um, by Lisa Lutter, who's shown here, um, has used- You have two minutes. Two minutes, it's, I think it's fine. Uh, so atomic force microscopy um, to calculate the, uh, the atomic force image from um, these structures, the, the, the structures that were solved by CryoEM. So essentially simulating an atomic force microscope image. And so um, what you'll see here is um, a heparin um, structure and an AD PHF structure. And then below again, we've got a whole range of these um, simulated 
um, atomic force microscope images, um, similar to the way we've done with fiber diffraction. And we can see then how similar, this, this graph shows how similar um, each one of the structures is to DJE, because we're interested in whether DJE is similar to any of the um, structures of, um, of, um, that of, uh, have been solved by cryoEM. And so here you can see that PHF is coming up very high. So we've got uh, good evidence um, that might persuade people that this is, um, this is a good um, model system. So finally, I wanted to just summarize and say what I've talked to you about today is that DJE overlaps with the PHF core. It self-assembles in the absence of additives, so we don't need to use heparin. The filaments resemble PHF in human brain, and of course we need to do more work to, to really characterize that structure. Um, <clears throat> and um, we think, at least from the work we've done so far, that the filament may share molecular characteristics of ex vivo PHFs. And below in this little movie, I'm showing you the point of all of this, which is that this DGE without heparin is a useful model system to explore our cellular effects. And show, so shown here is um, DGE being internalized into cells and you can see it um, being uh, associating with um, lysosomes. And this work is, uh, you can ex explain more here in Pollock et al. Um, and also it's a really good system to be able to test potential therapies. So we're working with, um, uh, with um, tau Rx therapeutics to look at inhibition of this um, assembly. And of course, I always get to the end and then I lose time and I haven't had enough time to say uh, the important part, which is of course the acknowledgements. So at least you can see a number of quite happy looking people here. I've highlighted people as I went along hopefully and they are shown in bold here. So the people that work with me now, the people that have worked me, with me in the past um, on all of this work that I've shown you today. Um, and as I've said, we work with Tower X Therapeutics and with Wei Feng's group at the University of Kent, Lisa and Liam. Um, and um, their work was um, that was done on um, nucleoli was done with um, Aidan Doherty at Sussex. So I'll finish with a slide of the University of Brighton if you want to come and visit, uh, the University of Sussex, sorry, but in Brighton if you would like to come and visit us when there's time and we're allowed again. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for excellent talk. Um, so um, do we have questions? Yeah, so there's a question from uh, Matthias Schmidt. Uh, could you find any hints of possible Ibiza fibrils in your tissue analysis? Uh, yes, well, so actually, we yes, we've got lots of nice images of um, AD filaments too, so we can use an antibody against a, um, out, uh, of, against a beta. Um, and we also see amyloid plaques. It's, it's very hard to see the structure of those filaments though, because they are very, very, tangled together. So they really are looking like a proper um, amyloid plaque. It's much harder to see the distribution of them. Perhaps also if, if I can ask a slightly more technical question maybe about the, the cryo-EM structures, they are often, as mentioned previously, also incomplete in terms of flexible regions on the surface and things like this. How, how do you handle this in the kind of prediction or the calculated AFM or fiber diffraction studies? Yes, I think that, um, that generally the field is convinced that there's a what they call a fuzzy coat. So mm -hmm. certainly there are flexible regions of the, um, of the tau that are still associated with um, the protein within the fi filaments. I think what's important here is that what they've traced is obviously the, the highly um, stabilized and um, non-dynamic regions of the protein. Um, and what we're trying to model really is that core. So I, we're not saying that there's not the rest of, you know, that there's other parts of the tau um, there and that they might have very important, um, they might have very important biological functions as well. Um, but I, so. I'd imagine it also contributes more to the AFM than to the fiber diffraction because if it's fuzzy and so you wouldn't necessarily see it in the in the diffraction, but or does it also become blurry in the AFM? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Actually, at the moment we haven't looked at the ex vivo filaments by AFM, and so that's something that will be definitely useful to look at. So thank you. That was a really nice okay. question. <laughs>